Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be continuing our series on carbonyl chemistry with part two of aldehydes and ketones. This is going to be chapter seven in our MCAT organic chemistry playlist. In this chapter, we're going to cover the following objectives. First, we're going to go over some general principles, including the acidity of alpha hydrogens and the role of steric hindrance in shaping reactivity. Then we're going to explore the heart of this chapter, enolate chemistry. This includes ketoenol tautomerization, the difference between kinetic and thermodynamic enolates, and how enamines act as nucleophilic partners. Finally, we'll apply these ideas to one of the most classic carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions in organic chemistry, the aldol condensation reaction, followed by a look at its reverse, the retroaldol reaction. Let's start with some general principles to set the stage. In a carbonyl-containing compound, meaning any molecule that contains a carbon-oxygen double bond, we use Greek lettering to describe the positions of carbons relative to this carbonyl group. The carbon that is directly attached to the carbonyl carbon is called the alpha carbon. The next one is the beta carbon, followed by the gamma carbon, and so on. The hydrogens attached to the alpha carbon are known as alpha hydrogens, and these are especially important because of their unique reactivity. So what makes alpha hydrogens special? It turns out that they are more acidic than typical sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds. That's because of the polarized nature of the carbonyl group. The oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it pulls the electron density towards itself, and that creates a partially negative charge on the oxygen and a partially positive charge on the carbon. This electron withdrawing effect weakens the nearby alpha hydrogens, and it makes them easier to remove using a base. If we treat a carbonyl compound with a strong base like hydroxide or lithium diisopropyl amide, LDA, it can deprotonate the alpha hydrogen, and that's going to form a carboanion. What's especially important is that after this happens, the negative charge is resonance stabilized. The lone pair on the alpha carbon can delocalize onto the carbonyl oxygen, giving us what's called an enolate ion. This delocalization makes the carboanion much more stable than you might expect. And this stability opens the door to a wide variety of carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions that we're going to cover in this video. Now, before we move on, let's take a moment to compare aldehydes and ketones in terms of their reactivity in these reactions. Aldehydes are generally more reactive towards nucleophiles than ketones, and this is due to two main reasons, steric hindrance and electronic effects. Aldehydes, they have one alkyl group attached to the carbonyl carbon. The other substituent is a hydrogen. Ketones, however, have two alkyl groups, and those bulky groups get in the way when a nucleophile tries to approach the carbonyl. That's the steric part. There's also an electronic component. Alkyl groups are electron donating, which means they help stabilize any partial positive charge on the carbonyl carbon. So in ketones, 
the partial positive charge on the carbonyl is slightly reduced because of the two alkyl groups, meaning that the carbonyl is less electrophilic and less attractive to nucleophiles in comparison to aldehydes. Aldehydes with just one alkyl group are less hindered and more reactive. So everything we've covered so far from the acidic nature of alpha hydrogens to the resonance stabilization of enolates to the reactivity difference between aldehydes and ketones sets the foundation for the reactions we're about to cover. So let's move into our second objective on enolate chemistry. A key consequence of alpha hydrogen acidity is that aldehydes and ketones can exist in solution not as a single structure, but as a mixture of two isomers. These are known as the keto form and the enol form, and this equilibrium between forms is called tautomerization. And specifically in this case, it's referred to as ketoenol tautomerization. Let's break that down. The keto form is what we usually recognize as the standard carbonyl containing structure. A carbon double bonded to an oxygen with alpha hydrogens next to it. But in the enol form, one of those alpha hydrogens shifts over to the carbonyl oxygen and the double bond moves between the alpha and the carbonyl carbons. The result is a molecule with both an alkene, so a carbon-carbon double bond, and an alcohol group, hence why the name is enol. The OL references the presence of an alcohol group. Even though these two structures look quite different, they are constitutional isomers, so they differ only in the position of a proton and a double bond. And because they interconvert, we call them tautomers. Now, under normal conditions, the keto form is usually more stable and therefore more abundant. However, the enol form plays a crucial role as a reaction intermediate. In many reactions of aldehydes and ketones, it's the enol or more often the related enolate ion that actually carries out the chemistry. So while the enol might not be the dominant species at equilibrium, it is often the most reactive species in the mechanism. But before we dive into how enolates are formed and used, this is a good moment to pause and clarify the distinction between enols and enolates since they're closely related, but they do serve different roles. An enol is a neutral tautomer of a carbonyl compound, and it features a carbon-carbon double bond, and it has that adjacent to an alcohol group, exactly like you see right here. An enolate, on the other hand, is the conjugate base of an enol, and it's formed when a base deprotonates the alpha hydrogen under basic conditions. While enols, commonly appear as intermediates during tautomerization, enolates are highly reactive nucleophiles that participate in many important carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions. Now that we've clarified the difference between the two, let's walk through how enolates are actually generated and how they function in carbon-carbon bond formation. Under basic conditions, a strong base can remove an alpha hydrogen from a carbonyl compound. Because that hydrogen is relatively acidic, this deprotonation is favorable, especially with bases like hydroxide ion, LDA, and potassium hydride. The removal of the alpha hydrogen leaves behind a negative charge on this carbon, a carb anion. This carbanion is resonance stabilized by the adjacent carbonyl group. The negative charge can delocalize between the alpha carbon and the carbonyl oxygen, and that gives us a structure known as an enolate. 
In fact, this negative charge is delocalized in this whole area of the molecule. This resonance stabilization is what makes enolates both stable enough to exist and reactive enough to participate in important nucleophilic chemistry. We can see this step represented in part A, where the base deprotonates the alpha position, forming the enolate. Once formed, the enolate serves as a powerful nucleophile. Its electron-rich alpha carbon is primed to attack electrophiles, particularly other carbonyl-containing molecules, and that sets the stage for the construction of new carbon-carbon bonds. One classic example of this is the Michael addition, which is a type of conjugate addition reaction. This is what's shown in part B. In this reaction, the enolate attacks the beta carbon of an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound, which by the way, is a molecule that features a carbonyl group directly conjugated to a double bond. The double bond shifts its electrons to accommodate the new bond formation, ultimately resulting in the addition of the enolate to the beta position. This is a foundational step in many organic synthesis and it forms the basis for constructing complex carbon frameworks. Now, a really interesting point comes up when we consider which enolate forms. In many cases, a carbonyl compound has more than one type of alpha hydrogen that can be deprotonated, and that's going to lead to different enolate products. These enolates differ in stability, and which one forms depends on the reaction conditions. This brings up a key distinction, the kinetic versus the thermodynamic enolate. The kinetic enolate forms fastest, and it results from removing the hydrogen at the least substituted alpha position. This is where there's less steric hindrance. So it forms rapidly, and it's favored at low temperatures and with strong bulky bases like LDA. On the other hand, the thermodynamic enolate is more stable. It results from deprotonating the more substituted alpha carbon, which gives us a more substituted double bond. It forms more slowly, but it's favored at higher temperature and under reversible conditions with weaker bases. So the base you choose and the conditions you set will determine which enolate is formed and therefore which direction your reaction will proceed. Finally, to wrap up this section, there's one more tautomerization pattern to know, and that involves enamines. Just like enols are tautomers of carbonyl compounds, enamines are the tautomers of imines. Imines are carbon nitrogen double bonds and when a hydrogen shifts from the alpha position to the nitrogen and the double bond moves into the carbon framework you get an enamine structurally enamines look a lot like enols but with a nitrogen instead of an oxygen and just like enols enamines can act as nucleophiles particularly at the alpha carbon in fact, they are often used in synthesis as reactive equivalents of enolates, especially when base-sensitive conditions are a concern. So to summarize, enolates and their related species, like enols and enamines, give aldehydes and ketones a rich chemistry centered around the alpha carbon. Coming up next, we have our last objective. Here we're gonna discuss aldol condensation. In an aldol condensation, a molecule of aldehyde or ketone acts as both a nucleophile and an electrophile. This dual role leads to the formation of a new molecule that contains a new carbon-carbon bond. And this product is called an aldol. The name actually comes from its structure. The product contains both 
an aldehyde or ketone, and an alcohol functional group within the same molecule. Now let's walk through the steps of this process, starting with step one. We begin with a carbonyl compound, such as an aldehyde, in the presence of a base, typically hydroxide. The base deprotonates the alpha hydrogen, just as we saw earlier in enolate formation. This creates a resonance stabilized enolate ion. This enolate then attacks the electrophilic carbonyl carbon of another aldehyde molecule. That's the key carbon-carbon bond forming step. The product of this attack is a beta hydroxy aldehyde or an aldol. So to summarize in step one, we form the aldol, a molecule that contains both a hydroxyl group and a carbonyl. But the reaction doesn't stop there. Under heat, in step two, the aldol product undergoes a dehydration step, meaning it loses water. This elimination leads to the formation of an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound, which now contains a double bond between the alpha and beta carbons. This extended conjugation stabilizes the product, making the condensation thermodynamically favorable under these conditions. Altogether, this two-step process, addition followed by elimination, is what we refer to as the aldol condensation reaction. Now let's talk briefly about the reverse reaction. The reverse reaction is known as the retroaldol reaction. In retroaldol, we go backwards. We break the carbon-carbon bond that was formed during the condensation. And to push the reaction in the retro direction, we apply aqueous base and heat. These conditions are going to promote the cleavage of the beta hydroxy carbonyl compound back into its original aldehyde or ketone components. So whether we're building molecules up via condensation or breaking them down via retroaldol, this chemistry gives us powerful control over carbon-carbon bond formation and cleavage, which is a central theme in both synthetic and biological pathways. With that, we've completed this chapter. I hope it helps. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.